Because you know, there's no way you can bet 10 times as much as what you are producing today. Okay? That's, some, that's a system that's gone out of control. Uh, when that happens, you know, bubbles begin to burst at some point in time. Right? No matter, uh, you know, whether there is uh, a perceived demand, you know, for housing in Kuala Lumpur, uh, if there's a huge asset bubble, it's going to burst at some point. It's uh, like it, uh, you know, started uh, bursting in uh, uh, different cities in the U.S. Right? There are massive, you know, China is going through a, a serious uh, correction uh, in terms of the real estate bubbles right now, as we speak. In the last few months, you know, there's been a 20 to 30 percent correction in the Chinese real estate market. Right, so uh, uh, if people tell you, well, you know, uh, it's it's a safe bet, you know, uh, uh, even if it's a bubble, it's a safe bet, you know, don't believe them. I think, you know, uh, at some point these bubbles are going to burst. They have to burst because, you know, if you begin to bet too much, you have 60 trillion and here, you know, you have notional contracts of almost 600 trillion. Uh, it cannot work, you know. It will take, uh, you know, several years for you to produce that. Uh, you know, the amount that is already being uh, considered to be part of, you know, uh, your real economy. You know, so, this is where, you know, uh, when, when this sort of betting becomes very huge, uh, uh, this is what Marx calls as fictitious capital. You know, money lending capital be can become fictitious capital. Because, you know, they are basically betting on a fiction about the future. Right? So, don't... Uh, uh, you know, so these people can be very destructive. So would you say derivatives are part of that fiction? It could be. I mean, not always. You know, derivatives are basically uh, creating some security about the future. Right? But if derivatives acquire a life of their own, right, you begin to bet on derivatives. You begin to bet on, you know, some of the secondary level or tertiary level mark, uh, you know, transactions. And they acquire an independent life. Especially when the link is tenuous to the base. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. When, when they get delinked from, you know, the real economy, which is here, uh, that's when, you know, you say there's a bubble. So, so the last bubble with the collateralized debt obligation, this is one Absolute. of those mechanisms. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, it's a, it's a manifestation of fictitious capital going, you know, uh, crazy. You know, yeah. they just went out of control. So, but at the same time, let us not uh, <coughs> underestimate the importance of money lending capital. As long as you have capital, you need them. Right, so when, when people set up this dichotomy between Wall Street and Main Street in America, right, it, it's the Wall Street people who created all these bubbles and, and the federal government in the US had to bail out the Wall Street people instead of, you know, helping the Main Street people. That's how the dichotomy is set up, you know, Wall Street versus Main Street. It's a false dichotomy in the sense that you have, you know, America had to bail out, you know, the Wall Street people if they had to prevent the real economy from collapsing. There was no escape from it. But the point is, what do you do once you bail them out? Right? If you bail out all the financial, uh, you know, the big players, why don't you take over their boards? No, why don't you take over the board of Goldman Sachs? Why don't you take over the board of uh, American Insurance Group? Why don't you, I mean, I mean the American state. Why can't they take over Bank of America, Citibank? You know, all these uh, financial institutions were bailed out. It's very interesting, you know, those of us who saw Inside Job the other day, uh, it's only the, you know, it's only Lehman Brothers that are allowed to collapse. Right? You can count the number of institutions that are allowed to collapse. Most of the financial institutions were bailed out. They had to be bailed out, otherwise America would have collapsed, global economy would have tumbled. Right? Uh, we, we saw a shock, but you know, the entire global economy would have collapsed. So you need money lenders, you need money lending capital as long as you have capitalism. But you know, the, the trick is, well, I don't think there is an easy trick. I don't think, you know, these people can be controlled. Uh, you know, once, you know, you get into the habit of gambling, you know, you are totally out of control. And that, that's what these uh, people are getting used to. But at the same time, you cannot get rid of uh, money lending capital. You need, you need money lending capital. But how do you regulate them? Is there a way of regulating them? Is there a way of controlling them within the capitalist framework? My argument is beyond a point you cannot control them. You cannot regulate them. Uh, all efforts at regulation will fail beyond a point. Uh, that 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 also uh, is one reason why you know I'm going to argue. You know there is no uh, long-term capitalism that's uh, uh, you know going to be stable forever. Capitalism is condemned to be unstable. So that's the theme of today's uh, session in a sense. All right. Apart from uh, these people, who else? 
it's a cut. You know, somebody uh, you mentioned that uh, government, the state or the government, gets uh, part of the surplus in the form of taxes, what you call as corporate taxes, right? Corporate taxes are paid uh, to the government. And why do the capitalists pay the state or the government? The constant anti-government rhetoric uh, that em uh, uh, emanates from the private sector, you know, from the big players, from big corporations, they're constantly, they have this anti-state rhetoric, anti-government rhetoric. You go to America, you go to any country, in fact. But they still pay taxes. Why do they pay taxes? Because the state provides them protection. And the protection fundamentally is about the property rights. Right? If the capitalist wants to uh, claim ownership over the surplus, what is the guarantee that the capitalist can, will get access to the surplus? There is no guarantee. Right? The guarantee comes from the fact that the state provides protection through its police, through its army, through its coercive uh, uh, machinery, through it the provides legal, protection. Through the legal system. Through the legal system, absolutely. You know, through through its uh, uh, coercive mechanisms as well as through the legal system, it provides protection to the capitalist classes. You know, it, it, provide, it provides protection of the property rights that are created, uh, you know, in the system. If, if the capitalist says, well, I own this piece of land, I own this factory, I own something else, what prevents an occupied movement, let's say, uh, from going and taking over some of these factories, right? If workers want to take over some of the factories, they say, well, we are working here. These factories rightfully belong to us because you know, we produce the surplus. We know that we produce the surplus and we want to own the surplus. We want to occupy this factory. What will the capitalist do? He calls the police or he files a, uh, you know, a, a legal case saying that you know, my property, my private property is being taken over by these ruffians, by these workers, by these thugs, right? This is, these are the terms, I'm not using them. You know, Bloomberg used them against transit workers in New York City. I'm just, you know, I suddenly remembered. Uh, so, state uh, extracts part of the surplus in the form of taxes. Who else? I mean, there are other groups who get shares. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, managers. The entire class of you know executives or managers, you know people who do MBAs and you know get into corporations, uh, you know as uh, managers, uh, they get part of the surplus uh, in the form of uh, compensation, executive compensation or salaries, whatever you want to call it. The entire managerial staff or supervisory staff, their function essentially is uh, how do I see? Suppose you are a human resource manager. Right? You, you, you do an MBA in human resources. What they essentially teach you is, you know, when the capitalist buys labor power, how does he, uh, how can he buy it at a low price? That's, that's part of, you know, uh, so, so these are the people who set the compensation of these workers. You know, how, how is the value of labor power calculated? So they'll be paid a bonus if they're able to depress the value of labor power. Apart from that, uh, workers are working in the process of production. How do you extract as much effort as you can? Right? There are different kinds of theories. Earlier, you know, uh, there was a belief, you know, uh, uh, some of you may have heard this theory X versus theory Y. You know, uh, you, you, uh, in, earlier, uh, you know, in the early 20th century, the belief was, you know, you have to be stern with workers, you have to extract, you know, you have to use force and all that. And then they got smart and they said, well, workers can rebel if you, if you are too uh, forceful in your extraction. So be nice to them. Right? Be nice to them, you know, treat them like human beings. You know, just create the illusion that they are also human. And then, you know, you you, uh, uh, you make them work harder. Right? You, you uh, keep creating various incentive structures for them to work harder. Uh, but you extract a lot more than uh, what you give them in the form of bonuses or incentives. You know, that's the idea. So they do it efficiently, they get paid a good salary. Basically to create the differential. Absolutely. I mean, uh, differential in the sense, you know, uh, through supervision, how do we extract more effort? Or how do we extract more labor? Or how do we extract more surplus? Right? So that's their function essentially. And when there are strikes, etc., the you know, workers could reach a point of, uh, uh, you know, point where, you know, they are uh, uncomfortable with the existing managerial structure and they may go on strike. How do you quickly break a strike? You know, that's how they get promoted quickly, right? Uh, uh, if, if you handle the industrial relations efficiently, uh, then you know you get promoted quickly, your bonuses improve, you know, 
So, so that's part of you know what managers do. Uh, another part is you know if you are a sales manager, uh, you have to come out with innovative ideas or how to move quickly between C prime and M prime, right? So it could be through an innovative process of advertising, whatever you may want to call it, or you know innovative sales channels, setting up sales channels, and you know things like that. All right. So uh, and then you have production managers here. Uh, these are some of the uh, facts and services. Anything else? Any other uh, groups that you can think of that live off the surplus? Accountants and uh, consultants. Yeah, accountants, consultants, you know, uh, you can even add uh, advertisers. Uh, accountants, you know, can be added with the managers. You know, they're not performing a very productive role. Uh, but you could, you could add them separately. What about media owners? People who create consumption, you know? People who create? Consumption through advertising. Yeah, that's what we already added. Okay, uh, they're part know. of that. Too. Yeah, they're, they're given a cut in the surplus because they're creating a demand, uh, you know, for the product that's being produced here. So, so it helps in the C prime to M prime again, you know, this part of the circuit. Right, so, so this is the complete model. So once, uh, you know, uh, uh, workers are hired, you know, uh, uh, the labor power of workers uh, is hired due in this stage, the first stage, <coughs> along with raw materials and technology. Uh, you put all these things in the process of production. So uh, capital has changed from M to, <coughs> it's a metamorphosis from money to commodity. And these commodities are uh, put in motion through the process of production and new commodities produced and then, you know, uh, a higher amount of money is extracted. And clearly, where the higher amount of money is coming from is, you know, uh, uh, from the fact that, uh, you know, capitalists are extracting more value from workers uh, than what